The History of Poland Podcast, Episode 48, Teutonic Relations. Hello and welcome back. If you'll recall, we left off last time by wrapping up a summary of the first few years of the reign of King Casimir the Great. This covered the first few years of the 1330s specifically. During these years, Casimir was deep in negotiations with the Teutonic Order over the final status of Pomerania. He was negotiating various treaties with the rulers along the German-Polish border, with Bohemia, and with Hungary. All the while, he was also figuring out what it meant to be king, working to ensure the support of the leading nobility of Poland, and making sure that his hold on power would remain steady. If you'll recall from past episodes, there are a few pillars to Polish society that have come to dominate the political landscape since the baptism of Poland. The first is, of course, the clergy, who are almost always some of the leading figures in every town, village, and city in Poland. Next up, we have the cream of Polish society, the nobility, who lord over their fortresses, duchies, and allotted territories in the name of the king. And finally, we have the Piast family itself, with nominal power over the entire kingdom. Mixed in there is a growing German immigrant population and also a growing Jewish population that was settling more and more in and around Poland. For Casimir to rule effectively, he would need to curry favor with as broad a swath of the population as possible. Yet, it would be difficult to really solidify his hold on power with all of the foreign affairs that drew his attention and divided the state. As a result, and as we talked about last time, this eventually led to Casimir visiting Visegrad and negotiating a settlement with the Teutonic Order over the status of Pomerania. All would be well in the land, right? <laughs> no. No, not at all. Regrettably, the Congress of Visegrad was not embraced by many of the people who Casimir needed to be supported by. This lack of support meant that the problems with the Teutonic Order would continue to fester and that Casimir would need to wisely navigate the domestic and foreign waters if he was to accomplish his objectives. The only issue here is that the actual objectives of Casimir are murky at best. While he may have had a policy he was pursuing, it's difficult to ascertain what that policy actually was. At first glance, it may have been a policy of wrapping things up and focusing on things other than Pomerania. Yet, as we'll soon see, at the instigation of some of the leading nobility, Casimir ended up pushing for a more aggressive, though still non-violent, approach when standing off against the Teutonic Order. The nobility that led the movement against the Congress of Viscrad had a few different reasons to push back against Casimir. Yet, one of the underlying factors was a feeling of resentment. From all appearances, this resentment was rooted in the fact that for years, many nobles had fought and died alongside Casimir's father, Władysław, with the pursuit of the reconquest of Pomerania as their chief objective. Now, with the Congress of Visegrad set before them on the table, many nobles believed that Casimir was unappreciative of the blood, sweat, and tears that they had poured out underneath the banner of the P.S. dynasty. To make matters worse, this diplomacy of Casimir's wasn't even beneficial to Poland, at least in the eyes of the nobility, but instead, in their eyes, it was an outgrowth of Casimir's youthful naivete and desire to win over the chief rulers of Germany. In essence, it wasn't just that Casimir was ungrateful toward his friends, he was also being too friendly towards Poland's enemies. Again, all of that in the eyes of the nobility. Building on the negative groundswell, the clergy piled on. Two leading clergymen were at the forefront of Casimir's criticism starting in 1335. One, who we'll only spend a bit of time discussing, was Bishop Jan Grot of Krakow. Grot's motives lack any panache and seem to be rooted in a yearning for power and self-promotion. Second, though, is someone we'll spend a good deal of time with in this episode, the papal legate, Galhard de Carcerebus. Galhard was born near modern-day Toulouse, France. Not much is known of his early life, but eventually he was appointed by Pope Benedict XII as papal legate to Poland. When Galhard got to Poland, he was focused on one overriding priority, to represent the interests of the papacy, then based in Avignon, and to work to maximize the influence of the Pope over Central and Eastern European affairs. As such, Galhard had a lot of opinions about the situation in Pomerania. At the forefront of his mind, though, was Peter's Pence. Peter Spence was a small tax that was levied in Poland and some other areas and sent directly to the papacy. Now, this may not seem like a huge issue for Galhard to focus on, but we need to be aware that Poland was one of a few places that had a contractual obligation to provide the revenue from Peter Spence directly to the papacy. Many other places had smaller arrangements, but Poland was uniquely valuable. 
which is why when Pomerania was cleaved off of Poland, it was concerning to the Pope that a large, wealthy, and growing area of Poland was no longer going to be a revenue source for the Pope. In the eyes of both the Pope and Galhard, this wouldn't do at all. As a result, when Galhard got to Poland, he took stock of the situation and realized to his horror that Casimir was trying to ratify the decisions made at the Congress of Wiskrad and permanently separate Pomerania from Poland. Immediately getting to work, Galhard made moves to undermine this ratification. Among his tactics was sending word back to the Pope about these moves that Casimir was making, the impact this would have on Peter's Pence, and why the Pope needed to come in against the Congress. It should come as no surprise that in 1336, the Pope did exactly that. Responding to a letter that Casimir had sent to the Pope asking for his approval of the Visegrad Agreement, the Pope had some choice words. First, Benedict said that the deal was ridiculous, obviously I'm paraphrasing here, and that he absolutely wouldn't concur with the results. Then, responding to Casimir's request that the Pope transfer the mischievous Bishop of Krakow, Jan Grot, the Pope reminded Casimir that he wasn't used to taking orders on who got assigned where from temporal authorities. And then finally, in response to a request that the collection system for Peter's Pence be modified, the Pope said, lol, no. While any rejection of such requests would have been upsetting to Casimir, they were undoubtedly even more upsetting due to the position he was finding himself in. After all, Casimir did not have a deep bench of support inside of Poland, and it's very likely that he was looking for some sort of validation from the Pope that he could use to further enhance his standing and authority. Instead, what he got was a decrease in his standing and authority, which, though I have no evidence of this, almost certainly got around in the noble gossip circles of the time. Facing these turbulent waters, Casimir was finding that he was ill-equipped to face a multi-pronged diplomatic war. It was one thing to figure out what to do with the order, but it was entirely another thing to figure out how to win over people who should be supporting him as his subjects and vassals. What's a king to do? Sliding up next to Casimir to help him out of this tricky situation was none other than Galhard himself. Seizing the opportunity to make himself useful to the king, Galhard slowly began working on Casimir's mind, hoping to sway him to be a more stalwart supporter of the pope. While we don't know what tactics Wormtongue, I mean, uh, Galhard used to win over Casimir, from all appearances, his efforts proved fruitful. Indeed, in a report to Pope Benedict in 1337, Galhard gave an update of the goings-on in Poland during his foray. In this report, Galhard gives praise to Casimir, who, at least in the eyes of Galhard, is now quite a stand-up character, thank you very much. He also makes mention of the collection of Peter's Pence, which goes to underline how significantly papal revenue played in adjudicating Polish affairs. The crux of the letter, though, is Galhard's focus on how effectively Peter's Pence is being collected, depending on the local leadership. In essence, he makes the claim that wherever Polish people were in charge, the collection of papal revenue was going great, but that whenever it was a German or Bohemian, it went terribly. This is clearly a boon to Casimir, who was of course more likely to appoint Poles in positions of authority than the Teutonic Order was. In response to this report, the Pope sent a letter to Casimir, exhorting him to stay true to the papacy and in support of the Pope. Not only does this help Casimir's domestic standing, it also had the effect of pulling Casimir even further into the embrace of the waiting Galhard. This was a big change from Benedict's letter to Casimir the year before, and it couldn't have come at a better time. Indeed, the following year, 1338, saw new movement on the Teutonic German front. Specifically, the Holy Roman Emperor was starting to take notice of everything going on to his east, and with what I imagine was a sudden clutching of his chest, realized that the Poles, Hungarians, and Bohemians were all becoming quite close friends. To make matters worse, they were even striking alliances with each other, with Casimir renouncing his claims on Silesia in favor of Bohemia, and with Hungary and Bohemia working towards an alliance of their own. Having a bunch of states team up on your border would always be concerning for any ruler, but doubly so when some of the nobles in those territories could quite feasibly pose a challenge to your claim on power. In response to this perceived threat, the emperor got in touch with the Teutonic Order. He sidled up next to them and was like, How you doing? And then proceeded to tell the order some great news. He was gonna take care of them. Specifically, he granted them all of Lithuania, uh, as soon as they conquered it, and told them that they were an arm of the empire and not of the papacy, so that if anything happened, they should turn to the emperor for direction, support, protection, and even a hug. Okay, maybe not a hug, but he did make it very clear that they were to align themselves with the emperor rather than with the pope. 
which is exactly what they did the following year when something kicked off called the Warsaw Process. What is the Warsaw Process? I'm so glad you asked. By this point, the Pope was strongly in favor of re-adjudicating the issue of Pomerania, so he decided to hold a trial to figure out what the result should be. He sent two judges, one of them Galhard, to Warsaw, and yes, I'll stick to the more English pronunciation here, if that's alright with everyone, to sort this all out once and for all. Now, Warsaw was only a small city at this point, really just a village with some minor defensive walls. So it was likely a big deal when the town was chosen to play host to the trial. And if you're wondering why it was chosen while it was still a small city, it was likely because legally Warsaw was independent of both Casimir and the Knights. Location aside, the Pope's instructions for this trial were clear. First, the judges were to figure out if the order took territory from Poland illegally. Second, they were then to determine if and how much the order should be penalized for their actions. Now, I don't know if it's just me, but if the instructions say, when you find them guilty, figure out how much they owe, then it does seem a bit of a foregone conclusion that they would be found guilty. Maybe that's unfair of me, but it does read that way. But just because the conclusion was pretty much set at the beginning, didn't mean that the knights didn't have the opportunity to defend themselves against any accusations, and even to bring up their own counter-accusations. Did they avail themselves of this right? No, no, they did not. Instead, the knights rejected the very premise of the trial, rejected the judges, rejected the idea that the Pope could determine these affairs, and almost didn't show up. But, and there is a but, they did show up. And they made four arguments. First, they reminded the judges that Casimir had technically been excommunicated, so how could he be participating in a trial? Second, he took an oath to uphold the peace, but he had invaded the Order's lands in 1329 with his dad while the Order was off crusading, breaking his oath. Third, he'd been allied with heathens and even married to one. Imagine how untrustworthy. And finally, he had promised to follow the agreement of Viscrad, but he didn't, showing his true colors. In essence, the Order was always operating in good faith and they just couldn't trust Casimir anymore. The judges then ruled against the order on all four counts, to which the order was essentially like, First one, you are out of order! You're out of order! You're out of order! The whole trial is out of order! The representatives of the order then stormed off in a huff. Following this, and a few weeks of deliberations, the judges inevitably found in favor of Poland. Then they ordered the order to 1. pay nearly 200,000 silver marks to Poland, 2. return Pomerania and a bunch of other land to Poland, and 3. reimburse the judges for their expenses. Which, by the way, what a move. And they then followed up those orders by putting the order under a papal ban. What's interesting about this, though, is that none of this ended up happening because the Mongols invaded Europe again. The Pope quickly realized that he might need fully functioning armies from both the Teutonic Order and from Poland to face this threat, and also realizing that there was no way to enforce the judge's decision anyway, and so the Pope reversed the stance of his own judges. The Pope asked both sides to come to a decision they could abide by, but before that could happen, the head of the order died of natural causes. Following the Warsaw process and the Pope's request to, please, everyone, can you just figure this out so I don't have to think about this anymore and so I can just enjoy the summer in Avignon, there was a flurry of diplomatic movement. First, Casimir's wife died, which opened the idea of a diplomatic marriage, but that fell through. Then he did get married, but not before sending his wife, who he turned out not to like, to go live in a castle alone for the rest of her life. Then, to top it all off, a confluence of events was leaving Poland increasingly isolated. First, the Hungarians were busy trying to conquer the Kingdom of Naples. Yes, that Naples. Sometimes history is weird. Then, Casimir lent money to Bohemia, which made them resentful of his claims over them. And on top of it all, the Pope was in the background being like, okay, I'm done with this. As a result, Casimir met with the Order in 1343 in Kalish. After much negotiation, Casimir and the Order agreed to resolve their issues. Casimir renounced his claims to Pomerania, the Order gave back Kujavia and Dobzhin, and the surrounding fortresses, Casimir agreed to back the knights in any future disputes with Hungary, and Casimir agreed to not help the enemies of the Order. To make sure this all worked out better than previous agreements, Casimir immediately went out rallying support from his subjects, getting promises from cities near Pomerania that they'd respect the peace, and making sure the agreement would actually stay in place. Then, on the 23rd of July, 1343, the Treaty of Kalish was signed and ratified. Now, while that's great news for everyone involved, the interesting thing to me is why this treaty was signed. On the surface, it doesn't really seem like a great deal for Casimir. But interestingly enough, the answer may have nothing to do with Pomerania at all. 
Instead, it may have been out of a desire on Casimir's part to settle this dispute so that he could open up another dispute somewhere else. Specifically, he may have wanted to avoid a war on two fronts, so he closed down the war in the north and west in favor of starting a new one in the south and east in Ruthenia. But that's a story for next time. Before I go though, I have two quick announcements. The first is that I'm going to be visiting Poland in a little under a month, spending a few days in both Warsaw and Krakow. If you have any recommendations of places to see that might be off the beaten path a little bit, please tweet them to me at History of Poland or email them to me at History of Poland Podcast at gmail.com. The second announcement is that I've started creating Polish history videos and posting them to YouTube. The first one is up and talks about the founding of the Piast Dynasty. They're all topical videos that I hope you'll find entertaining. They won't be as regular as this podcast, if this podcast is even regular to begin with, but if you subscribe, you'll see them when they're posted. And that's all for now. As always, a big thank you to my supporters on Patreon. This show couldn't exist without your support. If you'd like to join the ranks of my small but dedicated group of patrons, you can do so at patreon.com slash history of Poland podcast. And that's it for now. Until next time, thanks for listening. Thank you.